Thank you, Christy. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to everyone who's joined us online. We're glad that you could be with us today. It's a special day in the life of the church as we celebrate All Saints Day. But first, I have a couple of announcements that I want to cover. Let me put my glasses on so I make sure I'm telling you the right thing here. Uh, for all of you who may have been wondering, Miss Billy Sheffield is finally home. Uh, she got out of the um, assisted Sister Living Rehab Center uh, last week, first to last week, is that right? Yeah, so uh, we want to continue to wish, wish her well. If you didn't notice, out in the narthex, there's a table out there, and it's time for the Thanksgiving baskets that we put together for uh, Medora Elementary for some of their families. Uh, there's cards out there on what we need to put together each basket. If you want to do an entire basket yourself, then you can take one card from each pile, and that will put together a basket, if I'm explaining that right. If not, take whatever you would like and help us put together the baskets for those needy families. Do you remember how many she said she's doing? For 20, for 20 baskets, so 20 needy families that we're going to help again this year for Thanksgiving through the Medora um, Family Resource Center. Right, if, and if you all know of anybody that needs it, we'll, we'll get extra. We, we'll do more. So just uh, let us know if you, if you have a needy family in your neighborhood or on your street or somebody in your family that needs our assistance, we'll be glad to do what we can to help them out. And we need those items, please, by November 15th so that we can tell them we have them ready, they're ready to go. We make sure that we've got all the baskets pulled together well ahead of time and we can get those distributed before Thanksgiving. So November 15th is the deadline. And today is the deadline to help out the... Valley Station United Methodist Women with their Amish recipe fundraiser. So if you have something and you haven't turned it in yet, please turn it in today. Are you all close to your goal? Close? Well, they still need a few more items, uh, but uh, if you can help them, we appreciate that. Um, second Sunday next week, drive through second Sunday, the same drive through style you've been doing. Go to the back parking lot. Pull up to the gym door that you would normally go in for second Sunday. Tell them how many you need and they will get it for you and hand it to you in your car. You don't have to get out. We're trying to do this as safely as possible. Since Thanksgiving is approaching, there'll be turkey, mashed potatoes, gravy, green beans, dinner rolls, and dessert. Uh, miss anything, Linda? Is that it? All right. Um, 
Over the past few weeks, I've asked you to send out some cards to people, uh, some of our shut-ins or some that are sick um, and can't come to church. We don't, we don't want them to think that we have forgotten about them. So this week, if you would, send something to Scott Bryant. He's back at Doug and Gloria's house. You can use their address. If you could send him a note, send him a get well card, some, some thoughts, write him a little note and say, we miss you and we haven't forgotten about you. Your church family is still here for you. We're praying for you and we still wish you well. So if you could take care of that for me, I'd appreciate it. And tomorrow morning at 6 a.m., Lee Boyer is having open heart surgery at uh, Norton's Hospital downtown. He um, was having some difficulty. He went in for a um, heart cath and the doctor said it's too bad. It's too bad for us to do stents or anything like that. Open heart was the... Uh, the only option for him as they saw it, you know, all the, he was having all the symptoms, shortness of breath, having trouble just like walking out to his car. Uh, it's about a four-hour surgery, they tell me. Uh, his sister has my cell phone number, and she says she will message me or call me as soon as he comes out of surgery and they get some sort of report on his condition. Uh, I'll get it out to the prayer chain, and we'll try to let people know how Lee is doing. But we want to be in prayer for Lee. Uh, if there's anything else that I miss anything today, anybody I forgot to talk about. Okay, if you would join me then, please, in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the forgiveness of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we begin our All Saints Remembrance, I would invite you, if you would, to pray this prayer with me. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we give thanks, O oh God, for all the saints who ever worshipped you. Whether they were in vine-covered arbors or cathedrals, wooden churches, or some sort of meeting house, Lord, we give thanks for the hands that have been lifted in praise throughout the years. Manicured hands. Hands that were stained with grease and oil. Strong hands. And hands that have been, that show their signs of age. But Lord, in your eyes are all holy hands. We thank you, God, for those hard-working saints. Whether they were, wore a hard hat in life or an apron, whether they were blue collar or they wore a three priest suit, they left their mark on you and on all of us. And as your children, we come to you this morning, Lord, with a humble heart and a heart of gratitude. And we say thank you for the sacrifices made by those who have gone before us. Bless the memories of those saints. May they be in our hearts. May we lean on how to walk wisely shown by their examples of faith, dedication, love, and worship. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mary Ruth Wise.
Larry Tinberg. Dorothy Sherwalk. Carol Shank. Our last candle, we'll call the All Saints candle. It's for all those who have passed on that are in our hearts and our minds, but perhaps they were not a member of our church, but we recognize them this day.
Thank you, Christy. If you would, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, in the quiet, in the still of this time, in the, in the chapel, in this sanctuary, as we have gathered together here and at home, it's in that quiet that we long to hear your voice. But Father, we have come here gathered again once more as your church with our brothers and sisters in Christ here and who join us online and it is our time of worship. It's an opportunity that we have each week, Lord, that we show our gratitude and we offer our thanks and our love for all that you do for us. May our worship be an expression of our faith and our hope in you, Father. As always, we come to you in that strong and powerful name. The name is above all names, in that name of Jesus. Father, before we pray, we, we need to confess. We confess and we seek forgiveness in Christ. We often choose hate and anger over love and compassion. We hold on to grudges instead of offering forgiveness. We see each other's character flaws instead of looking at one another as a child of God. We have become a people driven by our emotions instead of your people guided by faith. We have We have valued the things of this world above you, God. And we fail to love our neighbors. Forgive us, we pray. And Father, during this time, I know we all offer up many prayers. We pray for the sick. We pray for the lonely, for the isolated. We pray for the homeless and the hungry. We pray for those who are abused at the hands of others. And we pray for those lost in the world. For those who turn to worldly desires and Lord, they still feel empty. Our world and all its people now need you, Lord, more than ever. Perhaps more than ever. Our country has an election that's approaching. In so many ways, we are divided over such a thing. But Lord, we pray for peace, that your will would be done and that peace would be with your people no matter the outcome. Lord, it's sad to say that we've come to a place where we can no longer disagree. That if you're not like me, then you must be my enemy. And we pray, Lord, that you would sweep across this nation and change those attitudes, change people's hearts. We need that healing love. We need your grace and your mercy to sweep across this land and all the people in it. So be with us, Lord, as we pray this very simple prayer that sometimes I think we say it out of routine, out of habit, But in my view, Lord, it is a prayer that says it all. When the disciples asked Jesus, he said, teach us to pray. He said, say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I can only imagine 
Christy, very nicely done. Today, as we celebrate All Saints Day, the sermon title for today is The, the Great Multitude. And I'm going to read out of Revelation here in just a minute. Um, do you ever do that? Do you ever imagine what heaven is like? You ever thought about that? You ever thought about when you attend a funeral and somebody has passed on? Do you imagine what they're seeing? Do you imagine what they're experiencing? Do you imagine who they've met? Who they've talked to? Who they've been reunited with? It's 
sort of makes you look at it a little bit different. Scripture today comes from Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. And I don't mind telling you, this is some of my favorite scripture. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one can count. From every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, they were wearing white robes. They were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God. Who sits on the throne and to the Lamb? All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and around the four living creatures, and they fell down on their faces before the throne and they worshiped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory, wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne, He will be their shepherd, and He will lead them to the springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. It's the word of God for the people of God, and we say, thanks be to God. Well, I just confess that I love the book of Revelation. I love to read about that throne room of God. And if you've ever tried to read the book of Revelation, it can be a little confusing. It can. A lot of imagery in there, and a lot of people interpret it in different ways, but, I mean, that's just one of my favorite passages. I can't wait to see it. That imagery of the great multitude in white robes that's before Jesus, to me, is a powerful illustration of who Jesus is, who he has been throughout the generations that great multitude in white robes in the the book of Revelation. That's the image that I get in my mind when we talk about All Saints Day. There's perhaps a more familiar scripture from the book of Hebrews that talks about the great multitude, I'm sorry, the great cloud of witnesses that goes before us. Uh, And I'd like to share just a little bit of that with you. It's from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1, and just part of verse 2, that says, Therefore, Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. All Saints Day means all that. And we give thanks. As a church, this is traditionally one of the days that John Wesley loved that he looked forward to each year. And it's a tradition of our church that we celebrate it in such a way. We think about that great cloud of witnesses, perhaps dressed in those white robes. Not only are their robes washed clean in the blood of Jesus, but they themselves are. But I bet our mind wanders back at times. I think we think back to those saints that we want to remember in our lives, those people who played a special part in our lives. I would suggest that we're all here today because somebody took the time and invested in you and invested in me. They encouraged you along your journey. They helped you to come to understand who Christ is. And they showed you that love of Christ. We, as a body of Christ, we have this great multitude that goes before us. Yes, we do. But who is it for you? Who is it that is in that great cloud of witnesses that was special 
to you? Who is it you think of on this day? Does someone come to your mind? Who is it that took that time to invest in you? You know, for me, over the years, one of the, the fascinating things that I'm, I'm, I'm privileged to do is when I officiate funerals, when I'm asked to do that, I get to hear those stories. I get to hear those stories of family members who talk about how this person invested in the lives of them, invested in the lives of their kids and their neighbors and so on. They say things, you know, you know my grandmother, she would sing when she cooked in her kitchen. My grandfather, well, he read the Bible every night. And he always seemed to have the right thing to say at just the right time. This person was such a great Sunday school teacher. They taught me so much. This person was just there for me. They were there for me when my mother passed away. And this person, well, you know what? They read the Bible to me when I was young. And then they treated me to ice cream. Those are the kind of stories you get to hear. That's the great cloud of witnesses. Recently, I heard this one story that sort of stuck with me. Whenever this person was asked why they did a certain thing, why they believed a certain way, why they acted in a certain manner, their response was, it's in the book. It's in the book. A little bit of wit, a little bit of sarcasm. Come on, you got to like that. It's in the book. Look it up for yourself if you don't believe me. I like that. I understand that we have this great multitude, these white robes that surround that throne of Jesus. I can see that in my mind. These memories of our, these saints in our lives. So I just got to ask, are you making that investment in people? Are you taking the time out to show somebody the love of Christ that you've been shown? Because that love of Christ that somebody passed on to you is meant to be shared. It's meant to be continued to be passed on. We don't grab onto it and just hold it all to ourselves. You know, one of the great characteristics that I like about Jesus, or at least in my mind when I think about Jesus, is that Jesus always made time for people. He took the time for people. Now, I'm not talking about his disciples. We know they spent lots of time together. We know that, they, that he taught them many things. I'm talking about the people that Jesus encountered just along the way. When he was traveling, when he was in these towns, when he was surrounded by many people, he would always stop and make time for people. The woman at the well, Jesus stopped to rest, and he meets this Samaritan woman at the well, and he stopped. He took time for her. They had a conversation, and that was life-changing for her and for all the people from there. There was the woman who had the, uh, the, the blood disease that passed him in the crowd, and she just managed to touch the hem of his clothes and was healed, and Jesus says, who touched me? And he stopped. He found her, and he spoke to her. He made time. He invested in her. He was going into a town, and there was Zacchaeus up in a tree. Jesus stopped and said, come on down, Zacchaeus. I want to talk to you. I want to come stay with you a couple of days. Jesus had a busy life. He had a busy schedule. He was always going somewhere on his way to do something, but he always made that time for other people. I realize most of us have busy lives. We stay pretty busy. But I would suggest to you, people have always been busy at life. That's just how it is. And Jesus was a very busy person, but he made the time. But I would suggest to you that it really doesn't take a tremendous amount of time sometimes to just stop and show the love of Christ to somebody. It doesn't take a lot of time. It doesn't take a lot of investment. I want you to consider something real quick because I might just contradict myself here a little bit this morning. Why not? Because I'm going to say, you know, it just doesn't matter how much time you spend investing in others. It doesn't matter if you choose to say the right words at the right time. It doesn't matter if you seek out other people to try to invest in. 
Doesn't matter. Have I confused you? Have I got your attention? It's not the first time that I've stood up here and spoke to you about, as Christians, how important it is that we invest in the lives of other people, right? It's called making disciples is what we're supposed to be doing. Today is not the first time that I've spoke to you about making time for other people. Today is not the first time I've talked to you about investing in others, about seizing opportunities. And then I stand here and tell you it doesn't matter. What matters is the work of the Spirit that is done both in you and through you. Our works do not matter. It's the work that the Spirit does through you that matters. That's where the power comes from. That's where the change comes in. Matthew Oakes has no power to do anything. He has no power to find the right words. My words have no power. It's only the Spirit working through me that carries any power. As we celebrate All Saints Day today, and we think about those who have gone on before us, if you're like me, I've already looked around this sanctuary and had my own time to remember some people. I've developed a habit on Sunday mornings where I come in here, and I imagine now where all of you sit. I imagine what it looked like before the pandemic. And I imagine some of the people that have gone on in the last few years and where they used to sit. Some of them guarded that spot (laughs) with their life. You're in my seat. That's okay. That's all right. I think about the joy that's taking place in this sanctuary. Now, the life of Bethany Church is, what, 174, 75 years, something like that altogether. And we've been at this place for 15 years, maybe 16, somewhere around there. But think about the joy that's happened in this sanctuary. Think about the, all the songs of worship, those hymns that have been sung in here. Think about the prayers that have been lifted up. Think about the confessions that have been heard in these very pews. Think about somebody sitting right here in this front pew toiling over that decision. Should I give my life to Christ? Is today the day? Is that really God knocking on the door of my heart? Is that what he's leading me to do? Think about somebody perhaps sitting in that third pew A couple of days ago, they got a bad medical diagnosis. They're wrestling with it. They're praying over it. Somebody sitting over here just lost a loved one. And they're asking God why. But there have been many happy times. There have been many weddings in here. Many great celebrations. How many times have you seen this pulpit wet with the waters of baptism? And I'll confess to you again that I realize everything we do these days, you guys wearing masks, all the preventative steps we have to take because of this pandemic. But I can't tell you how it saddens me to see these pews empty. It's hard. As I've told you, there was a time there for a while where I preached to an empty sanctuary. And I think about what the choir used to sound like. Those joyful voices that would ring this sanctuary. How we would all stand and sing our hymns. Some of you were like, oh man, we're going to stand again. But how we long, how we miss that now. 
You know, preacher, make up your mind. We're going to stand up or sit down. Come on, and we've all said it. You remember when the backs of those pews were filled with hymnals, and Bibles, visitor cards? Now they're empty. That smiling face that met you in the narthex and handed you out that bulletin. We miss that. Being greeted at the door in such a way. One of the things I think we all miss most is communion. Everybody coming forward, taking communion, kneeling at the altar, spending a little bit of time in prayer. It's those things that we once took for granted. Those things that once got a little mundane to us. Man, wouldn't you like to have those back? But friends, just as we celebrate those faithful saints, just as those faithful saints celebrate, as we celebrate them this morning, as we celebrate the faith that they show, the hope that they showed in Jesus Christ, then so shall we. Because just like death didn't get the final word in their life, then the world does not get the final say in the life of this church or any other church. This is not the first time that the church has been met with adversity. And it's likely not the last. The church will rise again. I believe these pews will be filled once more. I've talked about it for the last few weeks. Man, what is on the other side of this pandemic? What new thing is God going to do? I tell you, the other day I got a phone call from a lady who does missionary work for the Kentucky Conference And she asked me how she could pray for me. She said, usually we're out in the world somewhere and we're on different missions, but because of this pandemic, we can't travel. She said, so I'm contacting pastors and asking, how can we pray for you? I said, ma'am, if you'd like to pray for, for my church, then you pray that we will have the strength and the courage and the faith to do whatever it is God asks of us once this pandemic was over. I said, I'm not asking for us to return to normal. That ship has sailed. I don't want normal. I want want whatever new thing God is doing in the life of the church. I want to see God sweep across this great land. I want to see more and more people come to know Jesus Christ. I just want to be a part of it. I don't care if it's like riding a bunking bronco. I just want to try to hold on. Just let me in on it. Let me go with you. Are you with me? I'm going to invite Christy to come on up as we close out this morning. I just want to remind you that this church and every church all across this great land struggles. I found out the other day there are many churches that have never opened their doors back open to in-person worship. And that's their decision. I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just saying that, man, when this thing is over and those doors open again, I think there's going to be a flood. And it's not because of who we are, but it's because of who we serve. But I'm going to close out with another question. And it's something I, I seriously want all of you to consider. How do you want to be remembered? Maybe it's not a pleasant thought to think about, but it's something we all face. How is it you would like to be remembered? When your family and friends gather around to celebrate who you were, or perhaps you're celebrated at an All Saints Day, how do you want to be remembered? When you're called home, to join that great multitude in white. How will they look back on you? 
perhaps when your loved ones and your friends gather together in some pastor's office, as we often do here, and we talk about preparing a eulogy, what will be said? What will they say of you? How will they remember you? David Sparks always said, I just want my life to have meant something. I just want my life to have meant something. And he meant for Christ, not for himself. So I'm going to close out this morning with a little poem. And I bet you've all heard it. You're probably familiar with it. You've probably read it or heard it at some time. It's been around for a while. It's called The Dash. Anybody heard it? It's good. It was written by a woman named Linda Ellis. It goes, I read of a man who stood to speak at a funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on the tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that first came the date of birth and he spoke of the following date with tears. But he said what matters most is that little dash between those years. For the dash represents all the time they spent alive on earth and now only those who love them know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we live and love and how we spend our dash. So think about this long and hard. Are are there things you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left. All that can still be arranged. To be less quick to anger. And to show appreciation more and love the people in your life like you've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering that each special dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogy is being read with your life's actions to rehash, Would you be proud of the things they say? Proud about how you lived your dash.
invite you to receive this invitation. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him and who earnestly repent of their sin, who seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. If you would take a minute and wave to your neighbor, please.
Lord be with you. Lift up your heart. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. earth are full of your glory, both in and in the higher. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the higher. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread And he gave thanks. He broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat. This is my body that's been given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks. He gave it to his disciples and he said, drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant that is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father now and forever. Amen. You may take your communion. as we come to the end of our All Saints Day celebration, just let me ask you to do one favor this week. Remember Scott Bryant. If you would, please send him a card and let him know that he's not forgotten by his church. But also pray. There is a lot of speculation about what the election may or may not hold. There's a lot of speculation about what may or may not happen after the election. I ask you, God's people have got to pray. Nothing moves God to act more than when God's people pray. Pray for peace. Whatever the outcome may be, whatever it turns out to be, I have my faith and my hope is in the Lord. Not in a broken, busted political system. So we pray that the Lord's will be done and we pray for peace among God's people. Whatever that looks like at the end of it. Amen? Amen. Let's sing our song of benediction.